have a conversation as much as possible. So as Lisa said, um, so we want to know who you are, and you kind of kind of says on the screen. We've also asked you where you are, but the two other questions are how are you, and why are you here today? Right. So uh, not the bigger philosophical, uh, you know, what is your the nature of existence or your own existence? But um, if you can go into chat and just say, look, how are you doing today? And those of you who have joined us before will recognize a little graphic um, and list just a, you know, a dozen of the thousands of words which might describe how you're doing. So again, if you could do that, uh, we'll, we'll monitor chat here and um, just share how are you and why are you? Uh, so we see interested, like, why are you here? Yeah, that would be really helpful. Like, why did you decide to call in this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you are uh, to learn? So that's to learn what is the question, right? So like, I'm thinking about what to make for lunch. So that's one thing to learn. Uh, others, though, please. So why are you here? Uh, how do you use and sell mesquite? Okay, it's tough. Grateful I get to teach today. Oh, cool. Uh, sorry, but happy, anxious, thoughtful, uh, all green yolks. I'm a learner. I'm happy to learn in nearly anything. <laughs> so interesting. Interesting to work and curious. I'm feeling optimistic. You have a new mesquite and always good to check in. Yeah, I, I agree. Good. Okay. So as Lisa said, um, curious, you know, whenever you have something... Ah, okay. It's really helpful. So uh, again, we're here for you, not for us. And so understanding what you'd like to talk about or hear about is really helpful. All right. So I think we could, I think we could probably cover most of this. And uh, just keep my so here. yeah, good, good. Great. Okay, good. Thank you. This is really helpful. So I'm going to leave the slides up here. Um, and what we do is, in addition to sharing uh, sometimes a, a, an edited version of the recording, we'll share the slides as well. So you'll have these. Um, nothing's too new. Um, let's start with the model, right? And so... Um, I'm trying to figure out a good way to say this. You know, we've, we've been talking about this for 25, 28 years, and yet I still sometimes come up with a different way of describing the model, um, which actually drives some people crazy because we, we change our terms. Um, so kind of apologize for that. Uh, but the ability model of emotional intelligence, um, or the latest one, consists of these four related skills. And, you know, those of you who look at the research also know that there's these four things or skills, but it also is one thing. So it's a, it's a shorthand way of saying if you factor analyze mesquite, you get one score, but you can also get four scores. Other research says three, others say two, and so forth. But the bottom line is there is these four related abilities or skills and kind of use that language inter interchangeably, the terms, abilities and skills. Some years ago, uh, for about 18 months, uh, one of my colleagues would bug me almost on a daily basis to change the terminology and to make the model more accessible. Uh, and it was pretty annoying, you know, for like daily, have you ever considered changing the terminology? Wouldn't you like to write another book that's kind of short so people can read it really quickly? This person was so annoying that I found the best way just to stop that hassle and stop the whining was to just finally agree with what she said and write the damn book, um, which is what we did. That person is actually on this call today. I don't want to name names. Because um, right. this is a very litigious society we live in. Uh, but as a result of that, probably now four years ago, uh, a colleague and I, another a colleague and I, Lisa Reese is on the call, we came up with different terminology. And we used, uh, you know, this works in English. It may not work in French Canadian, but I like alliteration. So we 
translated in a way these four terms into map, match, meaning, and move. And as you know, what this all means is using that emotion map, how are you? And then we'll say, do those emotions match those of others? Kind of empathy. And do you match how you're feeling to the task? What is the meaning of the, like, so why are you feeling this way? And when we asked you how you were before, some of you said what's going on. Someone said, uh, you know, I'm teaching later today and that's energizing. So what's the meaning of emotions? Like, where is it coming from? And finally, since, you know, emotions can be helpful, but it's the right emotion at the right time and they're always changing. Can you actively move emotions to solve the problem, to make the connection, to get stuff done? So that's that's the ability model. It's really easy. It's very simplistic. But what we also say, it's it is really difficult to leverage these four skills at a high level of skill in real time under stressful conditions and on a consistent basis. Nobody does that. I mean, I certainly don't do it. Uh, and I want to actually, at least we should leave this in the recording. I certainly do not meet those criteria. Uh, and the reason I want to make sure I go on record is saying that in case any member of my family watches this. Otherwise, I'll put a little rebuttal saying, what's he talking about? Yeah, so this is really hard. Simple, simplistic model, super difficult to do this well, especially in real time. Now, what else we got here? Oh, um, and why is this stuff important? Um, uh, we've got, we, uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment here. Um, you know, a lot of, those of you who, who interview people, um, you know, for jobs and so forth, or for, you know, college and things, you probably were all taught to say when an interviewee keeps on saying we, you want to stop and say, and who is we? And what was your role in that project? Uh, well, I took notes. Oh, it sounded like, you know, so um, I want to be clear about the we in this. So the model is sometimes called the Mayor Salovey model. And, um, so the, the mayor refers to Jack Mayer, John D., but it goes by Jack. Um, I met Jack in uh, 1979. Uh, we were graduate students at Case Western in Cleveland. And then the uh, Salave is Peter Salave. Um, Peter and Jack met at conferences in the 1980s. Uh, actually, I think in Nags Head, North Carolina, talking about emotions and intelligence. Uh, Jack had gone on to Stanford and studied with a guy named Gordon Bauer about how moods impacted thinking. Peter was a grad student at Yale and then an assistant professor at Yale, and they met at these conferences. And so out of those conferences uh, came their model of emotional intelligence. Um, I met Peter, uh, I was a what's called a postdoctoral fellow at Yale in psychology in 1983. But Postdocs and grad students have nothing to do with each other usually. So it was somebody I saw in the hallway. I think the next time I saw him was a few years later at Jack's wedding. Um, anyway, and then you know Jack and I kept in touch. And in like 1994-ish, he said, remember this guy, Pete Salovey? He said, kind of. Well, we, we're writing these articles. We're calling it Emotional Intelligence. Uh, we'd like you to join us because by that time I, was, I had a career in business and uh, market research and things. Um, anyway, and he said, we'd like... Maybe you could help apply it. So I said, that sounds cool. And Jack said, you know, the timing might be good because at this conference, there's this guy who works for the New York Times. His name is uh, Goldberg, Goldman, somebody like that. And he's going to write a book on and, and talk about our stuff. So um, so anyway, that's the we. And I want to be careful about. Um, but I also want to be careful. Like, these are my views and not theirs. Um, so that's the we. Uh, just a pause there. Um, questions so far, comments, reflections on the model? I might have a question, David. Please. Um, 
Um, what about the relationship um, abilities or skills? Um, uh, are they how how are they um, incorporated or addressed uh, using your model? Uh, meaning, how do we um, do we differentiate abilities and skills? Is that the question? Well, actually, well, my question is, um, how do we, um, how to say, how do, how can we leverage your model to, uh, or use your models to help individuals, teams, and organizations develop social skills, like, for example, empathy and compassion. I don't know if compassion is a skill, but I'm just, you know, throwing ideas, you know, compassion, either a compassionate perception or compassion in action or, uh, inspirational leadership, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. Yeah. Now, now I, yeah. Um, so one of the things that we should have said at the beginning, uh, we certainly want your questions and we want your comments, but they should only be easy questions. Oh, <laughs> so that we don't have to think about the answer. And then the answers seem like, wow, that was really good. So I, I'd like to pass on that, Gabriel, if that's okay. okay. Sure. The, or no, <laughs> Just, thank you for laughing. Um, yeah, well, I think that's one of the cool things about the model. You know, it's not just the measurement, but it's the ability to to teach these skills. And we're very, we're very, I think we're very hands on. Um, and I think other than just a theory, it's cool at a theoretical level. Like, this is really cool. But for, you know, us, you know, at least we have our books around here. Like, wait a minute, you know, uh, here's one that's for teachers. Like. It's the application, which I think matters to us a lot. Um, I love the measurement piece. Uh, so, but I think it's such an easily applied model uh, to be able to teach these skills. Um, and we'll get into that later. You know, it's also this idea of, you know, so look, I, I'm, um, w when I went to graduate school, uh, Jack and I were in a lab studying human intelligence. And in the late 70s, it was intelligence is generally fixed. That was the idea. But even the most rabid of geneticists would say, yeah, it's mostly fixed, but there's a little component for the environment. So they let that, you know, that they open that door a little bit. But really right now, people talk about, you know, plasticity of intelligence. So the bottom line is, let's say I take the mesquite or I give it to a client and they really just suck at it. So they get the like lowest scores I've ever seen. Um, we don't tell them to go, you know, go back to bed and pull the covers over your head. Uh, we can help them, you know, acquire these skills um, and either directly acquire the skill and get better at it or get, quote unquote, smarter or develop workarounds, you know, develop strategies to do that. And then, you know, a lot of what we do in our training work is how do you apply this? Uh, and at least you want to talk about what a blueprint is, because I think I, I just find that very cool. So, yeah. Very, very timely. So um, yesterday I was in Washington, D.C., and I um, presented the model to 70 law enforcement officers who were there as the Metropolitan Police uh, Leadership Academy. And they are in bed. They want to make sure that law enforcement um, understands about emotional intelligence and how it can be really important. So, of course, when you're when you're showing up, I didn't give the mesquite to 70 people. But what I can do is I use this model and I use the alliteration of the map match meaning move. And it's very accessible, as David said, people get it because it really honestly is very easy. And I developed these cards that have the EI blueprint, we call it. So it starts with map, match, meaning move, and it walks them through four basic questions. You know, how are you? How are others feeling? You know, is it the right emotion? Are you matching the emotion? You know, do you know why we feel the way we do? And what are you going to do to manage or move that emotion? So again, what I do is I show them the blueprint and I call it a framework or a container to solve your challenges that are emotion challenges, emotion problems, you know, because when you come right down to it, when you're in the workplace, when you're with your colleagues, when you're in the field, you know, you're dealing with people, human beings, and it's very interpersonal. 
So the technical piece of it will only get you so far. And we hire smart people. They know, like these law enforcement officers, they know the regulations, they know the policies. But to learn about emotional intelligence and to give them a framework, and now what they do is they take that blueprint and they can now have, and I have on one side, I have the mood map. I have a little card, but I have a bigger one. But I have the mood map and then I have the blueprint. So they actually walk around with something that they can recall. So again, that's really mostly what I do. I love, like David said, the mesquite is fascinating. It's interesting when you go deeper and you look at the results and I'm a coach as well, I can coach those skills and see, oh, their mesquite was lower here or higher here. How do I help them build their skills or how do I have to help them leverage their skills because they're really good at it. So again, Stephen, I think that's a great question and it's absolutely, um, you can embed it and you don't have to necessarily give the mesquite to people, but you can definitely train the skills. And we can share those tools and you can either follow up with us. Uh, they're, they're in our books as well. Uh, again, it's, it's not hard to do one. Well, it's not hard to do on paper, just super hard to do in real, you know, in real time, all those kinds of things. Um, yeah. So, you know, going back to Mesquite, um, we, I was doing a call with managers uh, a few weeks ago and, and I kind of realized a lot of people come to this thinking emotional intelligence is the single most important thing in the world. Not true. You know, what is EI as we define it and measure it? You know, these are the, the, the this is why it's important. But you can still be a jerk and get really low scores and, and, and be very successful. But if these things matter, then this is kind of a great model to work on. And what are these things? It's about relationships, frankly. I uh, mentioned empathy and things like that. Um, and, and I think the outcomes are a longer term. If you're just doing short-term transactional work, you, you don't really need that stuff. So, uh, and we have these reviews and these papers are available. Again, if you contact us, we're happy to send it. Um, all right, but here's the cool thing. We're talking about abilities. Uh, so it's slightly, you know, going back to assessment. Why ability-based assessment matters. Um, those of you who know the, you know, the David Dunning's work, um, you know, where uh, th this is actually wild. They, um, uh, I forgot Sheldon a name. So David Dunning, uh, is, uh, I forgot where he is, University of Minnesota. I forgot. Um, anyway, so his work is about how people see themselves and how they really are. And they use the mesquite. Then they used a book I wrote with Peter Salovey now like 20 years ago. Um, and People scoring at the 10th percentile on Mesquite, really low, overestimated their scores by 62 points. It's like wild. That's nuts. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with asking people how good they are at this, that's one of the problems. But there's another study, not with Mesquite, that's the up above, that self of, you know, people, leaders high on narcissism also have these really positive self-evaluations. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or a nod of your head, but um, I think we've all worked for people like that, you know, legends in their own minds. I mean, and they never, they don't get it. I think that's scary. Um, uh, I know some of the folks on the call have a military background, but anybody a pilot by any chance or anybody do any flying take lessons or or does anybody has anybody does anybody do what i do which is to watch youtube videos on air crash investigations yeah i got it i got one thumbs up it's scary as get out you know captain so-and-so with fifteen thousand flight hours you know decides to this is actually a real story decides i'm going to fix this fault warning on my airbus 321 i'm going to pull the main circuit breaker um and in fact, the, the subtitle of this was, I have a better idea. Um, so anyway, it's just, it's wild, you know, working for a narcissistic leader, not only does it drive you crazy, but they make these mind boggling mistakes. It's really, it's very disturbing. And I think there's a lot of them out there. 
Because I think, again, if you're highly narcissistic, you also have this amazing self-view, like I am amazing. You probably interview well. You probably rise through the ranks and you burn your way through the ranks. Anyway, um, this is all really disturbing, which is why ability-based assessment we think is really, really important. Um, now, the mesquite uh, has its own challenges. So um, something called face validity, right? So if you take it, it's like, wait a minute, this is not what it, this is not emotional intelligence. Um, that's a challenge. Clients score low because, and they get pissed, right? Because, um, you know, one of the, some of the tougher audiences I've had uh, are going to uh, work with groups of N MBAs. They're in business school. You know, they're masters of the universe. They ace the GMAT. And then you give them the, the mesquite. It's like, you're average. You know, how dare you say that? You know, it's, it's, it's a tough audience. And the feedback is complicated. It's not easy. So we think we can address these kinds of things. Well, not think we can. I think we have with some success. So um, I'm just going to stop sharing again for just a moment. Um, and one of the things to note is that, so I, I've, I've given, um, I probably upwards of 3000 feedback sessions. Um, and you know, I, I, yeah, way much more than that. And I think early on, um, uh, and, and almost every one of those who is, was, uh, some sort of manager leader, um, you know, a couple hundred MBAs, maybe you know more than that, but mostly were in the workforce, pretty advanced. And I'd say at least half the time, I'd sit down in front of the person to give them feedback, and they'd say, "That was weird. Like, what the heck was that all about?" At least fifty percent of the time, maybe seventy-five percent of the time, it's not what they expected. And but for, for the last number of years. I can't remember the last time anyone said that at the beginning of my feedback. Like no one has said, what the heck was that all about? And there was a simple fix, which was, how do you frame this? And, and basically my instructions would be, if you've taken other assessments, this is different. Some of the questions don't seem related to the work you do. We're not asking for your personal reaction. So they got a warning. And so what you hear now, what I hear now is, um, how did you find the experience? You said, oh, wow, it, it was different. Yeah, it was exactly what you said. I didn't know what to expect. But yeah, it was different. Nobody's def you know, defensive that way. Nobody's ornery about it. No one, I mean, literally no one, it's kind of hard for me to say that, like no one, zero times, has started the conversation as they used to. So if you've used mesquite and gotten that weird reaction, um, yeah, same warning. You know, Steve, so um, yeah, and, and I give this warning before they take it. Absolutely. Framing is super important. And I think it's, as I said, it's gone, you know, the, the complaint rate has gone to zero, which is kind of low. So um, yeah. And David, I like what you said about, you know, making sure that they understand that it's an objective measurement because so many times the self reports they're looking through it through their lens and, and they've taken maybe EQ tests or other self report tests and so they sometimes will like you said they might overestimate their ability but i think that when they get their feedback at first it could be i either call it um affirming like they knew it or awakening like they didn't know it but usually by the time you go through the model and explain it, and we, we're we going to talk about that we have a guide that we, for coaches or for people who give feedback that really guides them to ask further questions, deeper questions, to make sure that the results yeah. resonate with the test taker. So if I have somebody that's low in certain areas, what we've done is we've created this guide that says, okay, so if they're low here, you know, here are some questions that you could ask them. You know, have you ever been surprised by people's emotions? Do people think that you don't read them well, you know, that you don't get them? Um, so we ask a lot of, of questions and usually the test taker will be like, that wasn't, you know, I knew of this about me. I've been told this about me. 
Um, you know, and like, let's say their management, their self-management was low, you know, yeah, I'm not taking care of myself. I'm always on, you know, my stress level is a 10 and I don't have any strategies. So that's where you take it deeper as, you know, because what you, our job is, is that once we give them the ski and we interpret it, we give them the feedback. And usually I've, it's very rare that I've, I've never, I don't think had anybody say those results don't make sense to me because usually upon reflection, and especially if I coach them afterwards, we can actually go back to those results and say, if you, you know, like, oh, you're having this challenge here, remember about your mesquite and this was a challenge for you. So what can you do to bring that, you know, strengthen that, or let's work on this. Um, but I just find that, that the guide is really helpful and you have this updated. So that's good. Yeah. I mean, I will also tell you this, that years ago, I actually, I had some disastrous feedback sessions. They were really, really bad. Um, I mean, it was really terrible. Uh, I, yeah, I won't share them with you because they were so bad. It sounds like it, didn't, it, it was unreal, but uh, not a lot, but a few, enough to really scar me for the rest of my life. Um, no, it's still, I, I mean, I have these vivid memories, no, no nightmares yet, but it was bad because what I did is like, here's the results without necessary preparation, um, without preparing the client. And so as Lisa mentioned, we have a boatload of stuff. This thing in the middle says coach's detail guide. It's a 36 page script. Now, no one ever uses it, but you know, when we go through our training, we'll say, you know, um, if let's say you finish the certification on a Tuesday, if that Monday morning, uh, if that went next morning, you have to do feedback, you, you do an okay job. You know, you may not be stellar, you may be awkward, but we've got a lot of support. And again, it comes down to framing because, uh, let's see, where is it? Um, huh, here we go. Um, so you see where it says cut off escape routes. That same study, Sheldon, Dunning, and Ames, uh, they found that people vastly overestimated their emotional intelligence. Well, uh, the story goes on because the story is even worse than that. They said the more you overestimated your emotional intelligence, the less interested you were in feedback, the more defensive you were, the less interested you were in developing these skills. It was really, it's very disturbing. And they call, and, and clients would then say things like, uh, not clients, well, research subjects would say things like, well, first of all, this stuff isn't important, you know, or this test doesn't actually measure my emotional intelligence. They call them escape routes. And so if a, cl a client takes these escape routes, you will never recapture their attention. You're done, you're toast. And so their advice is to cut off the escape routes before you start giving them actual feedback. And that's what these things do. And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so what are those uh, you know, escape routes? Well, you know, first of all, it's, this is cool. You know, going back to one of the questions about the model, using the model at a, you know, uh, at a different level, at a meta level. So we use the model to provide feedback on the model. Here's an example. I'll stop sharing again. So you get a client, you kind of know them. They, they think they're going to do pretty well and they don't. Yeah. And you know what? Their lowest score is on managing emotions, or we call it move emotions. What are you expecting? How do you think that feedback session is going to go? Especially if you did, you know, what, what I used to do years ago. It's like, here are your results. They're very low. It's not going to go well. You know, it's like, that was pretty dumb. So we use the model to explain the model. And so going back here, again, this is intentionally small to so, you know, uh, and we have these resources for you. But it's, we ask, how are you right now? How are you feeling about this process? How are your current feelings impacting your thinking? Are you in that white, right, the best quadrant to receive feedback? And then again, the cool thing is we have the results in front of us. Let's say they're low on the first ability, perceiving emotions or mapping. And they say, how am I doing? I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. Uh, Tell me why. Are you sure? 
then it's are you in the are your current feelings impacting your thinking? Is this a helpful place to 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 be? Well, yeah, I'm really you know pretty anxious, and it's a great place to be. Well, I might suggest that being a little lower energy and more pleasant, you be more reflective. Oh, that's interesting. Then we ask, move on to the third ability, meaning of emotion. We explain it. We say, hey, you know, um, how would you react if you got lower scores? I'd be shocked. I mean, don't you know who I am? Um, now, most people will say, well, I, I don't know. I kind of think I might score low. I might be a little disappointed. But you want to probe on that. And it's also the affect they have when they say that. Is that what they really believe? And then finally, well, you know, thank you so far. You know, the fourth ability is called managing emotions and feedback requires us to be open. What will you do to stay open to our, in our conversation? And if they score high on managing emotions, they're going to come up with great stuff. They're going to say things like, ah, oh, I love to take notes. Is it okay if I ask questions? I'm going to kind of think, has this, you know, ha has this happened to me in the past? If their score is on the lower side, they will say things, well, well, you know, if, if I don't agree with that, I, I, I will reject it because I know myself. And so we might, and then at, you need, would need to be ready to say, well, you know, okay, that's interesting, but why don't you think about, has this ever happened to you? Or I like to ask, is it possible the results are correct? I love that phrase because we work with really smart people. And so is it possible the results are correct? It's super hard to say no. Oh, it's unlikely, but, but is it possible? And so with that framing and you explain it and you're also kind of a kind, decent, you know, uh, uh, since you're, you know, you're all decent human beings, you're going to do this in a, in a, just a compassionate way. And so the feedback works very well. No one has thrown me out of their office. It happened once many years ago. Um, since doing this, uh, I think everyone, maybe not everyone, 99% of people have said this is really, really helpful. Maybe actually 100% have said that. So it works. So this is embedding the model at this meta level to explain the model to also get really good data um, on that individual. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to and, do it. And David, I also find too that the, these slides where we introduce the model, we actually, even before that, we have we put the test in context because, and what Dave was saying about cutting off the escape routes, because if you know, that somebody, let's say, scored lower, and you know that they're a C, in the C-suite, and this might they might not take it so well, you know. Like what we do is we will say to them, um, you know, let's put this in context. You can get a lower score and still be super a uh, super great leader because you've probably learned strategies. You work really hard, and you've developed this emotional intelligence. Even if your scores are lower, you know, you know what. Um, what compensating strategies you can use. Um, the other thing is we say that tests can be wrong because it depends on this, their frame of mind. Um, we also share with them that their scores are not based, again, we remind them it's not on their subjective opinion. It's based on the answers, the correct answers of 21 emotion researchers. And I think that gets a lot of people's attention. They realize, oh gosh, I was looking at it through when I was looking at all the landscape, it was through my experiences. But when we explain that it's going to be assessed their answer, there's more correct answers that are determined by these experts. That brings a lot of value to the instrument. Um, we also use that language that David was saying. We say they're hypotheses. You know, any test generates good hypotheses. So you're going to hear me say during our feedback like David just said, is it possible? Have you ever experienced this? Does that show up for you? And sometimes we do get clients that'll be like, nope. And you know what I say? Okay, then let's move on. Because you know, you're know you not there to convince them. You're there to share the results. 
And so it's, um, again, it's really important to anticipate, and that's using the model, the, the meaning of emotion. What if, you know, that emotional affective forecasting, what could happen during this feedback session? So you do your best to set the stage, you give them the context, you teach them, you show them the model, you know, actually doing the model, you walk them through their scores um, and you have this conversation. It's not just like, here they are, you got competent, develop, you know, whatever. It's a conversation. And you notice people really, like Dave was saying, these people wanted to take it. They're curious, most of them. And they reflect on it to say, huh, I wonder if that's possible or what if they were possible? Yeah, it's very straightforward. And, and again, you know, going back to this whole skills thing, um, skills can be acquired and or compensated, right? So um, I see. Oh, here we go. I was very surprised by this study. It's a meta-analysis, as you know, like a study of studies. Um, and I, I didn't expect this result, which is uh, it's easier to develop ability eye based on mesquite than than other measure, you know, than other traits uh, that are measured um, by other approaches. So uh, I was I was surprised and kind of pleased to see that it's not our work, right? So which is also really good. And th the whole idea of compensation or remedial strategies is really interesting. Um, in days of yore, let's say you might. Um, you might have uh, those of you who teach or um, if any of you were a child at one point in your life, I'm not sure if that applies to anyone. Yeah, I still am. So that's why I ask. But uh, yeah, so uh, a child is having trouble in school reading. And so they go a full on assessment, uh, a Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children, the Wyatt uh, reading tests. And you discover they have what's sometimes called a nonverbal learning disability. Uh, it's uh, it's tracking, and the reason they're not reading well is because their their eyes go this way and then skip. So imagine that if you if you're if you're not tracking and reading, you're you're not you're not learning stuff. So the simple fix years ago was uh, to give that child a ruler, and uh, not a clear one. So they would put the ruler on the text, and line by line. And then, you know, you can have now iPads and things like that. So it would show you, and their reading comprehension skyrockets. The underlying issue is still there. But the outcome is totally fixed. Let's say I, I, I score low on perceiving emotions. Do I spend the rest of my life learning to read faces? I can, and I can get better. Or do I use our emotion map and just say, um, you know, I'd like to check in with you. Uh, and in a neutral way, uh, how are you feeling about this? Because uh, just to, you know, a lot of people get very anxious about feedback. Or uh, can you just pick a couple of words here? And the person selects certain words. I mean, that's really interesting, right? And so that's a pretty quick fix for a lower score. So this whole idea of compensating or remedial strategies, pretty straightforward. Um, I love analogies. And you have to be of a certain age. Uh, yeah, so you have to know your audience. But I like the analogy of cholesterol. So my measured cholesterol is really, really low. But every day I take a pill about this big. That's my dinner. So, you know, a little pepper, a little, you know, uh, and I cut up this big giant pill and, and that's my dinner. And uh, without it, you know, my cholesterol is probably three times higher. So I'm not... Fixing it, it's a remedial strategy. Um, so David, we yeah. have a few questions that we, I know that we're getting close to our time and I wanna make sure we get to them. Um, so about Sarah, your your question about your gap about ways to strengthen people's skills. And you're right, it's um, the more you work with the model and the more you know the model, the easier it is to go there as a coach. That's why, and I hate, I'm not plugging this, but that's why we did the workbook. Because what it's done is with the book and with the workbook, um, 
you have these tools now. Yeah. Is that the workbook? Yeah. Yeah. And so what I do, yeah. And so what we're going to do is um, we are creating a course that's going to be an EI skill building course to teach you all how to teach these skills. Because we recognize that the reason why I've been able to do it is because I have been working for the last 12 years with David to help me go deeper in my practice, my coaching practice, so that I really understand it so well that I can now pivot as a coach and a consultant to say, how can I now help my client or my customer to go deeper? So we recognize that there's this gap, you know, we, we give you this, the, the model and we, we say, run with it, you know, just implement it. And I was able to do it, but it took a lot of work. And so what we're wanting, what we're going to do is next month, we're doing a intro to what this, how do you start incorporating the mesquite into your practice? But then we're also developing a one day course going to be virtual. And at the end of it, you're going to be certified in skill building, not to give the mesquite, because that's another, that's our May 1st and 3rd course, but how to actually do it, where it's going to be online, it's going to be virtual, David and I are going to be moderating it. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, you know, I'm a resource, David's a resource. And that's how I started to do it, is I said, David, I need your help. You know, what do you think? And that's why we did the workbook. So, and I use this, I do an eight hour workshop with meteorologists who are in the weather service um, and they have a leadership program. And I have my copy all dog-eared and I gave them all a copy of my workbook. And I was like, okay, turn to page five. We're gonna work on, and I give them the context and we work on exercises and they apply it to their lives, not theoretical, to that they're, you know, what do they deal with in the meet in, you know, the weather service? You know, they, they're all geeks. They're all technical, wonderful meteorologists, but it's like that interpersonal dynamic. And they start to recognize how important that is. If I want to get promoted, if I want to supervise people, you know, I got to learn how to build trust and build relationships. And how do I come across and how do I manage that emotion when somebody ticks me off? So they get it because you're just weaving it into what they already do. And that's what I love about the model. Um, let's see another question. Um, Zena says, how do you apply emotional intelligence to the delivering of the feedback from the test to manage your own biases when feeding back to the test taker? And that's a good question. Dave, do you want to tackle that one? I think it's using the model at that meta level. You know, it's also... Uh, we didn't mention it, but it's like, how am I feeling about this? And, uh, you know, to this day, you know, decades later, if, if I, if I have a person whose score is on the lower side, I am, I'm anxious before that feedback session. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that. Um, and I am even more careful than I would be otherwise. So, um, and I think that's helpful because it keeps me on my toes. Um, mm -hmm. I, I say that, I mean, the day I don't get a little anxious, before delivering feedback is the day I need to stop doing it, right? If you're just mailing it in, it's just not fair. And you're going to screw up. And a screw up here means you're, you're, you're harming someone. You're, I think you're doing harm, um, which is not <laughs> what any of us have signed up for. So I think it's using the model on yourself as well. And that's the cool thing about the blueprints, not just about the other person. It's about you. Am I in the right frame of feeling for this feedback session? How am I going to manage my emotions? What if someone says, starts yelling at me or, you know, when they get defensive, will I get defensive? Well, yes, I will. What strategies will I use to do that? So I think, you know, applying this at that moment, that's why this, again, it's super simplistic. It's kind of hard to actually pull off to do it really well in real time because it's you and it's other. And then that whole thing changes. And it's, it's not uncommon for someone to say, like really low score, C-suite, I saw a comment there, person who says, oh man, I'm not disagreeing. It This this makes sense. This makes sense. And you know the kind of relief, but you still want to be on your toes and be very respectful and so forth. So anyway, use the model on yourself. It's really, really, really key. Um, and you know, another, another comment or question about you know, the right answers and where they come from is true of any ability test. Um, right. So if you're a pilot, there's a way to, you know, V1, 
velocity one vr that's velocity rotate that's when you need to pull back on the on the control column and lift off and then uh there's a there's a time when you're coming down the runway you hit a certain speed you are committed no matter what's going on you got to try to take off because you don't have enough runway to leave so um a math course a chemistry course um emotional intelligence as an intelligence is an ability and there are we like to say righter and wronger answers um and so that's kind of where they come from you know we're changing that by the way so um in our oh it's over there but uh we have a called a youth version re research version uh meaning it's only on paper and it's not used a whole lot but starting with that we've changed the way we're scoring um it's called veridical uh meaning true so like veritas the latin veritas um and so it's a little different. It's what uh, it, it, it is how um, individually administered intelligence tests are scored. Uh, the ones that like for information comprehension and so forth. Um, so you basically what you do is you, you, you look at the research, you create a manual um, where the where the items come from. Then you have a panel, independent panel to go over that, make sure the research was done correctly. Then you have a panel of, uh, of experts in this thing with this coding manual, look at the questions. They assign right and wrong answers. Um, if they can't agree, it gets popped out, right? Because some questions, eh, it looks good to me, but this panel using the coding manual, it says it's a terrible question. So it gets popped out of there. But, but, it, you know, but that's the way you know, any kind of skill-based or ability-based test kind of should be developed. Um, yeah, and maybe it can be intimidating, but that that's kind of the kind of the best way to do it. Um, so. All right, David, we have 10 minutes and we have lots of questions to get to, and I want to make sure we hit them all. So, um, so as far as, Stephen, your question about advocating versus development, you know, when should we say that, somebody should work on compensating. It's really up to the client. If they want to develop something or if they want to find, you, you have to ask them, is it important to you? Why is it important to you? And mm -hmm. if they want to spend the time, great, help them. And if mm -hmm. not, move on. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, um, you know, getting certified. Um, so if you, we are having a course May 1st and 3rd. Uh, David and I are doing an online virtual course. We take a day off in between uh, because we want to give time to process. It's a lot of things to deal with. Day one is strictly learning uh, the model, the framework, um, the blueprint. You know, we go deeper. What is map? You know, what is proceed? What is facilitate, match, et cetera? So you'll understand the psychometrics of the tool and then um, what is being scored. And day two is interpreting the results, um, looking at a person's scores as a holistically and saying, what is this profile telling me about this person? Mm. Um, what are some hypotheses? How am I going to prepare for feedback? How do I prepare myself? And then what we do is we put you in groups and you actually practice um, giving feedback because, and we give you those tools, right? The guide, so that you have the guide um, and you can follow it through. And so that when you end the course and you take the exam and you pass, our goal is that you will feel competent because you'll have those tools. And what happens with confidence is that with practice, right? The first one's going to be clunky. The second one's going to be clunky. The eighth one's going to be, you know, it takes some time to really start to, you know, like David said, you're using the model all the time as you're giving them their feedback. And you're so it requires some skill. That's why this instrument re does require skill. It requires you to learn the model, but you have all these tools to help you. And with practice, then you can start to see, how do I help this client? And even if you don't do the mesquite, you can take those, those that tool and use it in presentations, skill development, you know, workshops that like of what I'm doing. So that's that question. Okay, let's see. David, is there anything in your slides that you think we need to go through because we only have a few minutes and I'm going to read more questions here. Yeah, we wanted to make sure we, this was for you and not just for us. 
So um, just looking at another question. The new uh, mesquite. Do we want to talk quickly about the mesquite too? Yeah, not for a while, not for probably a year or so. Um, it does not require recertification, but we're really no, psyched we about um, doing like refreshers and things like that. So um, yeah, so uh, like the model is the message. I like that. So like, you know, you can use it in coaching, embedding and training. You know, a lot of people th talk about emotionally intelligent organizations. I don't know of any, but it would be pretty cool, right? If you were to build something from the ground up, um, the model is the message, you know, embedding this in your coaching, in your training, in your teaching this of the skills, but in your teaching, you know, right? Uh, you know, those of you who are, you know, lecture, um, how are you feeling about it? Are you setting the right tone? What about your students? So this, it just kind of applies to everything. Um, and so, uh, yeah, um, that's just the other thing to think about. It is pretty powerful and, and, and enormously useful as well. So I just want to share that idea. Um, you, you know, just very quickly, I mean, years ago, well, probably 30 years ago, when our youngest was, well, I, I, yeah, anyway, um, he promised to clean up his room, you know, that Sunday and, you know, he did it. It was Monday morning going off to school and, you know, you wanted to yell at him and just, you know, ground him, but he's going off to school. Why would you want to do that on Monday morning? Wait till Monday afternoon. That's a different story. So there's so many ways to embed this model in pretty much everything you do to the extent that you're able and you have the emotional resources to do so. So I just think it's really cool. Emotions exist. They're flowing throughout our lives. And so the question isn't whether they exist. It's whether, like, what do you want to do with them? That's the real key. And that's why I think this model is so powerful. We also like to say emotions are data. So the model works great with analytical people, engineers, meteorologists. Um, I had a conversation with someone at West Point last week, you know, and, and, you know, those of you who have served in the military, I know some of you have. Um, yeah. So, you know, the United States Army, do you know what their values are? Loyalty, duty, respect, honor, courage. There's an emotional component to that. And you're telling me that you don't want to learn about this? You are about emotions. So anyway, um, that's just a, emotions exist. That's not, that's not the question. It's, do you want to be smart about it? Which is why I really like the model. I think it's very cool. And assessing it is a great way to do it and so forth. So yeah, I just want to share that. Um, so we are getting close to our time. And uh, this is great discussion. Thank you so much, because I think it's important that we we share this with you because we've found this um, this tool to be very helpful. And that's what it's all about, right? It's about helping others gain these skills so that they can make their lives and the, the world a better place. And I know that sounds very Pollyannish, and I am. But I really feel like the more we can introduce this model, that it's not scary. It's fairly easy. It's easy to understand and apply. But like David said, it's this awareness. What we're trying to do is raise people's awareness that emotions are critical and they form the foundation of all relationships and trust. We connect through our emotions. They, they make the world an amazing place. So rather than suppress them, we want to bring them out. And this model, again, like Dave was saying, for the technical field, especially those people that are skeptics, I think it resonates really well with them because there's a lot of research that David and his colleagues and people around the world have been doing. And it's exciting to see that you can improve your competencies. So um, yeah, so it's all good. All right, David, anything closing? Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, and, just, uh, and if you, we're if you, here. If, if you haven't read the uh, the, the chat messages, uh, any of you uh, do so. Um, how do I want the future to feel? And uh, mm -hmm. I don't really care about myself, but I care about my grandchildren and children. And I, I want them to feel hopeful, accomplished, 
you know, to be good citizens. Uh, I love that. I'm going to watch, I don't usually watch things, but I'm, I learn a lot during these sessions. So I, I want to appreciate you attending uh, and participating and, um, and making us think about stuff. <laughs> so um, yeah. I do appreciate it. And we're always here. We'd love to, you know, uh, yeah. Love to engage. Um, and we will be yeah. sending out the, uh, the, the slide deck. And on the last page of the slide deck is all of our information. Yeah. You know, you can, we have so much available and we love to be in communication with all of you. So we are here for you. Please reach out. And uh, we're really thankful that you're here. We're going to have our next session. Um, the third, it's always the third Wednesday at this time, 10 a.m. Eastern New York time. Um, we love that people across the world are joining us. And our certification course is May 1st and 3rd. So if you still want to get in on it, you have time. So please just reach out to us. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate your time. Bye-bye.